Hello. So hello? today, hello. Today uh, we are continuing our uh, series, our dialogues with the masters of the mysterious art of translation. And today, uh, my guest is Lars Kleberg. Uh, Lars Kleberg is a Swedish literary critic, writer, and translator of plays uh, by Chekhov and Slavomir Mrozek, as well as poetry by Lev Rubinstein and Adam Zagajewski, whose dramatic trilogy, Starfall, was itself translated into several languages, uh, and the author of Chekhov's biography. As professor of Russian, um, he was one of the founder of the Literary Translation Seminar. Uh, he's the chief editor of the Swedish Translation Dictionary. So Lars, uh, welcome to the RACC Movable Studio. Um, and um, I'd like to tweak a little bit our tradition and start by asking you about this uh, dictionary of yours, because sometimes I see it as uh, it's it's re it's referred to as translation dictionary, and sometimes an encyclopedia of translators. So, what is it? It's it's a, a dictionary or an encyclopedia of translators, uh, and it's not for well, it's for translators too, but it's it's not a, anything like a dictionary. It's it's a biobibliographical. Um, dictionary of uh, important figures in the Swedish history, history of Swedish translation, including actually from actually from the Middle Ages to or from the Renaissance to today. How how big is that? How big? Is uh, that? Well, it's well, it's it's endless uh, because uh, it's not a book. It is a, a database, so it's an online. You can get the address and show it. It's um, it's an online publication, which um, is a never, never ending, never ending story, actually. But we have 550 entries, very solid bio, biographic essays and a complete bio, bibliography of every chosen translator's works. So this this would not fit into any kind of book publication actually and and it has many advantages uh, we can add we can change we can you know so it's it and it it's is still active and it's founded in or the first publications were made in in 2008 so it's already 14 years ago we went online um but it's it's growing. It's still growing, and we have, to my, um, uh, actually, uh, <laughs> it's a great pleasure to see that we have now followers. I mean, not only readers. We have like ten thousand visitors every month, and this means three hundred people, different people, go in there every day or more than three hundred. But we have also. Uh, projects, sister projects in Germany, in Norway, in the Netherlands, and uh, there will be uh, coming dictionaries also in in uh, in Poland and and so on. So it's 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 a, a network or a chain chain of dictionaries we had. That we started, we started the the, the whole thing here in it's Stockholm. Remarkable. It's remarkable because the the idea is it in Swedish? Yes, because it's it's it is a manifestation for the Swedish reader of what the Swedish literary history has so far forgotten or never, almost never mentioned. All these people who who published more of half of all the books in Swedish since the beginning of history up to today. Um, more sometimes, less sometimes, but it's, uh, so it's the other side of the history of Swedish literature that comes to, to, to the fore here. The, the very idea is extraordinary because um, translators, as we know, uh, until recently, at least, they were, in fine print, sort of, so mm -hmm. you 
you would mm -hmm. see a book never on the cover. Uh, and um, in, uh, in, uh, if it's an anthology, in a tiny, tiny uh, print somewhere, if not in the back of the book. So um, this is uh, extremely important, even, I don't know, ideologically in a way. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. It's not only a scholarly, uh, scholarly uh, thing. thing. Oh, oops, it's not mine, it's yours. It, it, it's not... Uh, only a scholarly uh, product because it's it has it's literary cultural politic politics actually it's 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 a manifestation of of what this this profession means and has meant in our culture to our culture I, I wish we had something like this I don't know if we have something like this in English I'm not sure I I, I don't no. know anything like this so as, far. yet, yet. Um, so now, my, my traditional question, I ask every guest uh, of mine, uh, how did it happen that you started translating A and B, how did it happen that you started translating from uh, Slavic languages? I know you translate from Polish and Russian and I guess maybe in, from other Slavic languages. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I don't know really, in, in school, in high school, I was already interested in in uh, in translation maybe the, uh, actually i have there was a small uh, bilingualism in my family i think that happens with many translators in this case my mother was danish and my father was swedish um, they were both philologists uh, librarians and and so translation was not a completely foreign um concept for for me and uh, we had books in translation of course and the swedish literature but um there was something was i was interested in finding out what what don't we would what do we not get in our culture what is on the other side what is far away uh, i was a jazz fan and i think it was somehow through my American interest in, interest in American culture. Uh, this was, of course, be long before the internet. Um, I, I got hold of a journal uh, magazine called Evergreen Review. Evergreen uh, Review I found in a bookshop in Stockholm. And uh, it was uh, amazing, you know, you, it's a legendary publication. And it was interesting because it was not only American literature, there was American writers there, but it was also a public, um, a, a forum for European avant-garde literature in English. So I got to, um, and um, I got interested in, and both in the B generation uh, literature, and uh, when in in our Latin classes, which were, I'm afraid to. Say, not so, at least did not attract me very much. Um, our teacher was trying to force us to translate Horace, uh, of course we did, but only for the, only, only for the purpose of finding grammar, grammatical, grammatical rules and examples. There was nothing of literature in this. So <clears throat> uh, in the, uh, behind my Latin book, I often had uh, uh, an issue of Evergreen Review with me in, in the classroom. <laughs> um, and um, well, there I found, of course, uh, some, I think, some things by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, uh, Allen Ginsberg, uh, which I, who I started both started translating them and and a play by Samuel Beckett, which, which was my first published translation, I think, a crap's last tape, a short play, which, which I did oh, and published actually in our school, school, high school arts magazine. That was, so this was probably my first uh, more, yes, how I just, but then I, I, I thought I should, well, uh, I, I was supposed to go to the university, of course, and uh, um, 
I said, oh, well, I want to study American literature. Uh, <laughs> so I went to the English department there and uh, I realized there was no American literature there. And uh, I realized only on the second semester we were getting close to Chaucer. Uh, so I realized it would take very long time until we could get uh, to 20th century, uh, uh, even less American literature there. So, so my brother uh, was in, in the army, in the army uh, language school, and he was learning Russian there. I never got into that fine school. Uh, I think my grades were not good enough, but, but uh, I was uh, intrigued by his uh, knowledge of this Russian. And so I went to the Slavic department in, in Uppsala in the University and, and I started learning Russian very slowly, very, that was, it was very old fashioned uh, classes and uh, took very several years before I could say a, a sentence in Russian, I guess. This is the I was about to jump so many times in, in your story. Uh, the first time I was um, I wanted to jump when you said jazz because I'm also a jazz fan. Uh, and um, uh, we need to explain to 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 our listeners who are not that evergreens are those um, standard um, standard melodies, standard themes in jazz that uh, we uh, do we other people who can play new variations on? Yeah. And um, uh, when you said um, uh, that about your teacher of Latin, I, I thought Chekhov. This is this is so much Chekhov. This <laughs> this yeah. typical character from yeah. Chekhov. Who, to, yes, to, whom whom I, whom I did not read at that time, at least, or maybe some Swedish translations, but it was not no. I didn't realize that he was a typical Chekhov character. <laughs> but that intelligence or uh, military school uh, language training, it's so, so typical. I've known of so many, I, I know so many translators who, who came to Russian mm -hmm. literature, in, in fact, to the golden age, even not even to the 20th century, uh, just from, from being an intelligence officer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, well, you know, and this, this was, but also at the university for for uh, uh, quite not military, but but there was still you know this was the Sputnik age, and um, I'm I'm so old I can remember when I went out in the in the night in the night in our in Uppsala, which was north of Stockholm, university town, um, and watched uh, simply. Uh, looking for a Sputnik. So on the on the dark the dark heaven, suddenly there was something moving slowly over. And you know at that time there were only uh, in in the summer you could see star falls, but that was something different. But this was this was the, the first Russian Sputniks we could see them uh, if we were informed when when to go out and look for them, and it, this is uh, nowadays it, <laughs> it's so banal we can see there's so much junk <laughs> uh, there, there on the sky in the sky. But that, at that time it was uh, it was really uh, so. It, this was the time of the first Sputniks, and uh, and there was a big interest in Russian language, and there were some interesting people going to going to the Soviet Union journalists and also also older students and uh, um, so but uh, but uh, this this is more politics perhaps or or yes Khrushchev of course and all this there uh, but for for some reason because I guess because of my interest in any kind of avant-garde I also was interested in the legendary uh, Russian avant-garde like, which for for me at that time was, yeah, Mayakovsky, maybe Malevich, Eisenstein. That was what I've heard about. But that, so that that uh, spurred my interest in going on with with Russian. We'll talk about your starfall today. Of course, we cannot not uh, talk about it. It's uh, quite amazing. Uh, I read it um, as late as last night to continue reading it. Um, 
but we do have star falls here uh, in Pennsylvania, where I also live. Uh, there's less star, um, light pollution and yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see star fall sometimes, and so sometimes uh, my dog and I can 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 watch it. Um, and we we see we say in Swedish at least that when the star falls, you should wish. But I guess wish on upon a star is it's it's common. It's in English also. Personal. So Chekhov, um, the great Chekhov. So we'll 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 get to avant garde, but um, let's. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about classic. Um, so um, you have this dialogue um, that uh, I find uh, so full of metaphors to, uh, of translation in, 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 in various ways. Uh, it's called Chance Encounter in, uh, in Bad Nauheim. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Chekhov is, is one of the two characters. And he says something uh, extraordinary uh, to me that is so universal. I don't know if he actually said it, you'll tell us, but, uh, or it's your invention. He said that about his uh, friend, um, uh, artist, uh, painter, Leviton, that uh, the foreground and background, very often they hover and they switch places. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw that this is, this is uh, how we translate and how we translate classic in particular, because I, um, I, I like this um, uh, quote, um, from Ezra Pound um, in his essay of ABC of Reading, he said something about classic. A classic is a classic not because it conforms to certain rules or uh, fits certain structural rules, but because of certain eternal and irrepressible freshness. So speaking of Chekhov, what is um, freshness in of his plays and of both his plays and his prose. What's there? Well, yes, there is. It's a huge question. It's, it's uh, I don't think there's one answer to this. Um, the freshness of, of Chekhov. Uh, well, first of all, um, well, I must say I, I came to Chekhov quite late as a translator. I, I did. I was uh, uh, also interested in theater, contemporary theater. I was a theater critic. I also translated some uh, uh, British and especially some American plays, like um, Jack. There was a uh, off Broadway writer, Jack Galber. Uh, this was the Living Theater productions that were inspired some Swedish directors. So I translated. Uh, connection by by Jack Galber and uh, some other other stuff from from the off Broadway scene, um, and it took a long time be before I started with with the Chekhov's plays actually, <clears throat> and uh, well, Chekhov is uh, is difficult in the sense that there's no no simple answers when you <laughs> start with you start working with Chekhov. It's, he avoids all kind of simplification. Um, but the attraction of, of Chekhov was probably he, he came into literature in a very strange situation. You know, the end of the, the great Russian realist novel, that was the, everyone thought that if you're the, a writer of, of any standing should should uh, appear he must he must uh, because it was a he uh, uh, he must he must uh, somehow uh, stand on the line of of Turgenev, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy and and uh, and he he well different reasons it didn't suit him uh, it didn't fit him he did, he didn't like that uh, he had, um, I wrote, which was the start actually of my biography of, of Chekhov, which is not a personal biography, it's a literary, it's about he, how he came, how he became Chekhov, so to say. Um, and my, I had a reflection, I think is, which is quite, uh, summarizes this thing. The world, uh, the world, according to Chekhov, was so great it 
could not fit in the format of the big novel. It was, it was redundant. It was overflowing. It, the, every life, life was so rich. Life was so. It it didn't suit into the format of of the the novel. The traditional psycho, psychological novel was uh, was had so many strictures, so many, and of course cliches and so on and rules and so on. What to how to write a novel. And and he he thought for himself. I'm sure that the big format is not enough for reality. Reality is much bigger than that, richer than that. So, and he so he wrote small things and a, a universe of small stories and of course longer stories also, but also his plays are. Uh, so full of things that you could not fit into a strict five act drama according to Ostrovsky or someone who was earlier. It was so everything, he was not afraid of that uh, things are falling apart. It, it is, that's, that's life. Things does not, do not fit together. The problem is of course that you, you have to understand how he he still manages to keep this together, uh, or his plays. His plays are house of cards, you know. It's house of cards, and you can't understand how this house is standing, but it is. It is. There's no extra place. He keeps it standing. And and his plays are something like that. You you can't understand how it works, but it it works, it works. And uh, so this fascinated me just both when I translated and then when I wrote this uh, this uh, book, which is called Chekhov and Freedom. This this aspect is extremely important, and in fact, I wanted to um to approach it a little bit from a different side. But since we are talking about that. I hope we're not interrupted. If we do get interrupted, I will send you another link. Um, as readers of, as readers, uh, especially as readers of poetry, and especially um, uh, those who are uh, experienced readers of poetry know that texts are not about words, but about the relationships between the words and things like the, the way Lucretius would uh, say that they cast light upon each other, onto um, each other. And um, the structural, you, you mentioned the house of cards and the structural um, uh, aspect of, of the text is very important. And of course, it's very unique for every reader because even for the same reader at different moments in life, we, we see different pillars, so to speak, different structures and, um, uh, the, uh, the whole building changes every time we look at it or we walk around it, yes, uh, we enter it. Um, and um, uh, in your dialogue, uh, Chekhov says, you see, I'm not interested in the minds of my characters, but in how they reflect each other. So it's also true for the characters in his play. Um, we, um, we, we, we are not, able to talk about film today as well, although it's, it's a fascinating um, uh, twist on the same <laughs> uh, the same ideas. But I just um, want to uh, recall one episode that I think is uh, extremely important and to me is a metaphor of transcriptions and translations. Um, Eisenstein, who is the main character in, in, in your Starfall, um, he, in 1940, he writes this script for Boris Godunov. And uh, he writes this opening scene in the cathedral, in Uspensky Cathedral, and he uses some remarks from Pushkin verbatim. And then he just stops and um, there is silence. So there is action, there are passages, the camera moves. Mm, and it moves for exactly the same time as one would need to utter those words that he omits. Mm -hmm. 
And then this uh, theme that is important to him of premonition and grief, uh, this thunder of history reappears. So he only uses the, um, the pillars that he ch chooses, what he calls the motivation of nests, the motivation of the necessary, right? So uh, in your plays, as you translate them, as, you tra as a translator, what um, would be those elements and what would be those reflections in Chekhov that you want to preserve while silencing uh, others uh, because we have to silence something? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I would, say, I would like to not, um, add uh, this dialogue, which is between two young doctors who are both actually they're very ill and death stricken. They wouldn't live more, live more than 40 years, uh, both of them, a Danish doctor and, and Chekhov, which I imagine that they could have met in some spa in Germany um, uh, on a visit there to, to get some relax or uh, rest or perhaps. Uh, but um, and and there, of course, this is they never met. I don't know if they were there at the same time. Uh, so it was a, it was a it was a way of also forcing perhaps Chekhov to say some things he never said. But I think he was he he was reflecting about. I know, however, and we know that this painting. This painting by Levitan, uh, the Storgi, uh, Haystacks, yes, which is a marvelous little picture. Uh, he was extremely fascinated by that. And that is an absolutely perfect example of this moment where the, you don't know what the background and the foreground, what, what is actually the foreground and what is the background. And there's some oscillation. Uh, and, and this is, of course, uh, well known in Chekhov's plays. There are also an oscillation between foreground and background. Sometimes the background is more important and, and, uh, and, and that what's going on in the background is, is actually more in, important. And especially this, this insecurity or this, this oscillation between the both is, is very important. And I, this is a hypothesis, uh, but uh, and I never start working on it because it would take so much research. But um, I figure or I imagine there that Chekhov was interested in Japanese art more than, than he might. Well, but he doesn't say anything about that. But Japanese art was at the turn of the centuries. In it was a a great thing both in in France but but also in and in, in Russia and uh, and there in the in the Japanese woodcuts you see these things that the the, the artists of nouveau art or, or the modern style uh, were actually uh, attracted by which is this strange well, it's a destruction of, of, of the central perspective of the Renaissance central perspective with all, with all its uh, implications of power, discipline, uh, subordination, and so on. And, and I think this is, this is something that, that interested uh, Chekhov. But, um, but how? There's a problem with my translations. <laughs> Uh, for me, I mean, uh, in this, that sense, that uh, they're very, I think they're very in, intuitive. I have, of course, an understanding of Chekhov. I have a very special, uh, or I have my own idea about what Chekhov thought was important and less important, and how this actually sometimes changes what's important and what's it less important but the importance of the detail for example it's it's extremely important and um, and um, 
when when starting, I never translated his his stories actually, his prose. Uh, well, although uh, although I'm 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 a scholar, uh, and uh, at the same time I must say my my work uh, as a translator, with my own translation, is very intuitive. I don't calculate. Of course, intellectually, I I work through the text. I read it, read it. I underline. I think this is important. This is this must be there. But when it comes to the question of 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 rhythm, what is actually the the correct or the good or good the, or uh, the the living rhythm that would would be correspond to to Chekhov. This is this is absolutely it's 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 dark. This is darkness. I mean, I don't know really. I, and it wouldn't help starting counting syllables or or clauses or anything like that. It's it's much 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 more. It, it's it's the idea. The thing is to find a tone a tone and uh, of the play and and then. Uh, of course, with uh, Czech was quite po popular in Sweden, as in many countries, and it has been tra translated several times. And uh, I thought when I once looked into older translations, I thought they were all too sweet. They were all too soft. Um, Chekhov was much more much more cruel. He was, in a way, he was a destructor. He destroyed the old conventions ruthlessly. And also he, uh, uh, he was short. I mean, the, the translations that I read, they were usually very long. Uh, Lots of water used, absolutely unnecessary uh, explanations, which was completely foreign to to Chekhov's uh, e extremely uh, compressed way of expression. Expression, and that's why why there's so much uh, and on the, under under the water. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the iceberg, the iceberg of of Chekhov. His prose and his plays are you know, there's so much underneath, underneath. Uh, but to catch that or to to try to uh, represent that or show that to a Swedish audience is it's it's very intuitive for me at least. So in, yeah, in intuition. So um, uh, pretty much. Um, you, you have already answered this question that I had um, about two approaches. There, there are two traditions of translation, we would call them even in Middle Ages, uh, while translating ancient uh, authors, ancient um, classical authors. Uh, the, so, so to speak, gene, uh, genealogical, where you Told the translator is a reader in the first place and a reader of the predecessors. And there is a succession of translations where each one turns back to, to, to the predecessors. And on the other hand, there is this second approach, which is assimilation, which is you just plunge yourself without as if there were no, had been no no predecessors in that sense. You don't explore, you don't act as a scholar in a way, and you don't research, you just dive. And uh, it sounds to me that, that at least uh, you probably use both, but at least the second one is, is uh, closer to you. And, and I think it's, it's, it's appropriate for Chekhov, of course, it's not ancient history, but still he's a, he's a very, uh, uh, He's being translated a lot. Let's let's put it this way, and uh, with a lot of padding, yes. Um, uh, and what he 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 says in your dialogue, <laughs> um, what interests me is not mirages, 
but how people perceive them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine I, him, Dostoevsky? He's just, you know, rather scathingly, <laughs> uh, uh, without all that psychology. What is of interest is not the ego, but the sensations themselves, the pure uh, sensations. So, um, in your dialogue, he's talking about this Japanese theater, about actors who, on on one hand, they try to imitate the predecessors. They try to keep it intact as if there were no uh, progress, uh, no um, development in, in theater, yeah, yeah. as if the uh, time stood still. Yeah. This, uh, on the other hand, each actor in each performance, each maybe even second of each performance, this is already my addition, uh, it's now here and now. Mm -hmm. so it's in, in the present. And um, it's, um, I think Chekhov is saying in your dialogue that it's, it's as if uh, the theater, the wooden building had been burnt and then rebuilt again each time. Exactly as it was from the beginning. Exactly as it was, right. So um, would you agree that this is a metaphor for tra on, of translation in general? Uh, see, I am a little bit... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think... I didn't think of that, but yes, I think that that it's it can be used as a metaphor for translation. And but then your avant-garde, you wrote the book uh, a book on avant-garde theater, and actually I have a it's it's very interesting to me personally because I have a family connection with the Russian avant-garde theater of the nineteen twenties. Um, um, two two lines. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Emily, go, go there, one as an actress and one as a um, theater um, stage um, artist. And uh, of um, Brechtian uh, kind. And uh, I, I wonder the, if the uh, reader, uh, we have a reader in the text, right? And the translator is in between. So the audience and the theater, the stage, did anything change drastically in terms of the relationship between the audience and the stage um, in, in, in avant-garde theater as, as, a, as a phenomenon, and in Russian avant-garde theater in particular of the 20s. Mm, yes, yes, I'm, it's, um, Chekhov would not have liked, uh, Russian avant-garde theater <laughs> of, the, of the 20th century, I think, because he, his idea was uh, uh, very much to let the reader alone, let the reader don't press, don't press him, don't force him, her to any conclusions. Let the reader judge. Uh, and, and this is kind of, he went, this idea of, of, of freedom for for the audience in the 20, especially in the 1920s in the avant-garde, there was some uh, rather crude uh, experiments or ideas how to how to control the responses of the audience. I wrote about this in, in my first book, uh, and there there, which was pure post Wagnerian kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, although with a different look, but still there was this idea of, of controlling and uh, grasping, holding uh, the audience uh, in a stiff uh, or in a, in a complete concentration. Uh, and this was used then, then for ideological also for ideological purposes. And Eisenstein's films are of course uh, masterpieces, but also examples of this kind of, of aesthetics. Uh, if Chekhov had uh, seen modern contemporary or post-war film in, in uh, Europe, I, I would think he, he would have loved the Italian neorealist Neorealists, uh, the De Sica and uh, and these these people. That that was Rossellini. That was his kind of. Uh, 
you know, because yeah. there is there's a freedom, there's a freedom for 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 the spectator, which which the avant-garde does not did not allow for, and this was also uh, a reason I think for my writing this this these uh, this three little plays, this triptych of where where Eisenstein, yes, he is appearing in all the three parts. I wouldn't say he is the main character because the main character is more abstract. It's the, the main character is the, the concept of the avant-garde of, of how to get around with, uh, come around with the, the, the spectator and uh, in many ways and uh, and Brecht was thinking differently. He, he appears in in polemics with with uh, uh, Brecht. I imagine they. Uh, I know they they met on a train in 1932, and they met in Moscow, perhaps in 1930. Probably yes, in 1935. And um, Brecht's idea was uh, that let let the spectator. Uh, make his conclusions. Of course, he wanted them to make the right conclusions. <laughs> so it was a, a freedom with uh, certain restrictions, because uh, Brecht had also, also, of course, had the political uh, po political ambitions and the political. Uh, yeah, he thought it was necessary to make art for people to think critically. Uh, I, Chekhov was not absolutely not in, into this ideological. His idea of freedom was much wider, much deeper, and uh, I think it's 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 this is something that makes his makes his plays so attractive today also, and 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 also his prose, his prose, which is marvelous. Which is uh, yeah, um, it's, it's also probably could could have something to do with the with the politics and the the the, the, the this at least whiff of uh, totalitarian uh, control mm -hmm. uh, that uh, expands uh, to to control of of the author or deformer and the audience slash the reader right so it's. Uh, in a way, it's it's uh, there. There is some uh, not that necessarily in, in terms of manipulation, but in terms of some uh, some um, more more rigid ways of controlling uh, the response. Mm, yes. Do you think? Yes, absolutely, and and therefore, uh, in these three part in this uh, three part construction, it's important that at the end uh, there is a. A dialogue again. There's a meeting between that never took place, but between Eisenstein and uh, Michael Bakhtin, the philosopher, who had I don't think Bakhtin liked Chekhov, but his idea of freedom, his idea of freedom, and uh, and his skepticism or his ironical attitude to this uh, all these Wagnerians and post-Wagnerians. Was so profound and uh, deeply, deep. Yes, he 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 philosophized uh, about this all his life, about uh, the freedom of the reader uh, in dialogue with the author. Yes, but uh, this was one of the. So that that was the probably the. There, there, the avant-garde met its its uh, other its. The big, the con uh, on on the uh, contrary contrary force or or worldview, and uh, so there's this is probably where where it they should they should meet and don't don't understand each other because people in these dialogues don't understand each other at all, um, but uh, but uh, it's it's a way of showing perhaps. The, the avant-garde at the end of its road, and and another way of looking at at the world, at things, uh, both in terms of space and time. Uh, Bakhtin, I, I have Bakhtin saying that 
you you're too much in a hurry it's right you have to <laughs> you you're you're pressing for time you you have to be patient i don't know maybe my books will not be read printed or read now but sometimes in the big time where he was reasoning uh, this was a, he had a different concept yeah but uh, yeah. freedom is uh, freedom is, uh, is is an eternal freedom and freedom of um, uh, freedom of perception not only freedom of expression is an eternal theme and freedom comes with uniqueness of each perceiver right Un uniqueness of the perceiver and i guess that's what you're talking about the um the um you, you allow you you allow for being a, a reader to be unique, uh, the uh, spectator to be unique. Okay. And Martin, in in that play that you're referring to on the Ash, Ash Wednesday, uh, the third play where uh, Eisenstein is talking to Martin, Martin is saying something that is so pertinent to translation. Again, um, he's <laughs> saying that words like our grammarians uh, think. Um, our venerable grammarians think that uh, words are just coins or chess pieces and people just exchange them, but they're what they are, that they're just solid, rigid, unchangeable. Oh. Whereas... Uh, yeah, I, 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 I say, I say, <laughs> I let uh, Bakhtin say that there are gifts. There are gifts. gifts that change hands. But, yes, and as they change hands, they become richer. And, and and this is this is about translation and various transcriptions even from, from yeah. languages that are very different and ba based on different uh, paradigms like Chinese, for example. Still, there there if there is a way to change hands. And he said something very funny because you're you're uh, there. There's a lot of um, wonderful humor in, in in your texts, and <laughs> he says something that I liked a lot, he said, what, for example, you say life is beautiful, he says to, uh, Martin says to Eisenstein, and Eisenstein says, you want me to say life is beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you just uttered it <laughs> by asking that, you just uttered it. So even you, if you and I just say this, utter these words with the same serious expression, we would still have two absolutely different, separate, unique utterances. And this is, of course, very, very important for translation. I wanted to ask about translating a, a living author, uh, someone with whom we can actually collaborate. And um, uh, I wanted to ask you about your work with Lev Rubinstein and when, mm -hmm. it, when did it start, how it, how it started, how it progresses, anything you want to say? Lev Rubinstein, yes. Uh, Lev, Lev Rubinstein is, is an um, outstanding poet is a master of of the word, the Russian word. He, he is uh, deeply ironic, and uh, mm, someone said, some critics said, Rubinstein, this is Chekhov today, <laughs> and uh, uh, without exaggerations, there is a. There, I think it, it, there's something to, to that. Of course, his his idea of the, mul the multiplicity and uh, how how world has has fallen into pieces is much goes much further than than Chekhov. He lives hundred years later, and so on. Um, but if you want to know with Rubinstein, I I met Lev Rubinstein in Moscow in the nine early 1990s when I was working in Moscow as a cultural attaché. Uh, I, I, I worked there for, as a job. I was not a professional diplomat, of course, but I was working because they wanted to, or we wanted to have some cultural exchange programs in the new situation of, of the perestroika. And, and uh, so, and, and there, uh, Rubinstein was a, a prominent figure in the underground, which was not <laughs> any more underground, but slowly appearing. And I was um, I was extremely fascinated by his uh, his way of writing and his way of reading his his texts. You know, he, he wrote 
for a long time, his poetry was not published at, at all. And it was written, he wrote his text on, on cards, library cards. So uh, a poem would not exist in the form of a manuscript, but in the form of pack, pack of cards. Um, and uh, and then then he and he, he I heard him perform several times uh, together with his colleagues. Uh, they were also interesting, but but Rubinstein was something different. And and when I came back to to Sweden uh, in 1994 in the summer. Um, this was what I had with me, actually. I wrote, I never wrote any diary, Moscow diary of the Swedish, you know, diplomat or whatever, or, you know, Moscow secret stories from Moscow. No, but I had this, I had his text with me. And, um, and I worked um, now and then. I also uh, had the opportunity to work with a, a friend who is a, a extremely uh, important person uh, in my academic life and in in, my, in the literary life. I think in Stockholm, it's Irina Sandomirskaya, who um, with whom I I worked through this these texts several times, and it would, took a long time. And I also tried. I made my own cards. And I read them in some in in some private uh, um, at some birthday party or something like that. And uh, the irony and the extreme, you would say, context-bound, um, ironical uh, texts of of Rubinstein, which which often consist of fragments of something you think he might have heard in the in the uh, metro or in the street, uh, words you know who have passed, which have passed that fascinates uh, has fat fascinated the writer in, in some way. Also pseudo quotations or true co actual co quotations from strange texts and so on. And I thought it was very much context bound, of course, but at the same time there's something more. There was uh, a rhythm, a structure, uh, a discipline, and an absolute uh, control of, of the language, which I think I managed to to somehow uh, get through into 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 the Swedish. Irina Sandomirska helped me, of course, with understanding, with all the other context, and especially. Uh, Especially the problem is, of course, what is this not about? <laughs> it is something that that every translator struggles with. I, I think that uh, you have to know what, so you don't get the wrong. Oh, is this related to this or not? Uh, is this a false track? Yes, it's a false track. You have to go on. So. Uh, because you're always trying to at least find some contextual hints, you know, or thing, uh, something to, some contextual, uh, uh, well, work on the context in some way, but you have to know where, where to stop or where, which is wrong. And so, but nevertheless, the, the texts seem to work. And then uh, uh, Rubinstein came, only then Rubinstein came to Sweden to some polit polit political festivals. And we read our texts, our cards together, um, you know, like the card players in Cezanne's painting, you know, sitting <laughs> um, in front of each other. And, um, and it, it was, we were extremely successful and he was extremely successful, but but uh, the, the second voice that I, I managed to uh, um, I managed to formulate uh, also worked and and this ping pong this linguistic ping pong um, 
was was really successful. So we we worked together. Of course, I I realized that things I had to rework, and I asked him sometimes, but he's very he's very reluctant to give any commentary on on, on his own texts. In that sense, uh, he can talk about everything else, but uh, when you want to find out what it's about and uh, well, this is this is this is something that uh, I I came up with this, or uh, well, it's from my childhood, or something like that. You know, so it's uh, it's not um, you don't get any explanation of some kind of deeper meaning because the the deeper meaning is not there; it's somewhere else. It's uh, it is uh, so. This is also kind of house of cards that. Rubinstein with actual cards, but his his linguistic his linguistic construction, his composition of these texts is extremely strong. I mean, it's extremely stable. Uh, you wouldn't wouldn't think that. Uh, and uh, so so um, I work with him sometimes, but. But uh, it's better, I think. You, you should have an inform informant as a, as a translation. I think that's that is essential. I had that when I worked with the Polish texts. Also, you have uh, with the help of, you know, um, I I don't trust translators who think that they they can do everything by themselves. It's I'm fine. I. I have my dictionaries, I have my knowledge, I have my confidence and uh, you know this uh, for me it's it's essential and that's of course I'm working in a different way that than professional translators who have to produce uh, x uh, a number of pages per day or per week or so it's translation for me is of course uh, a different kind of activity, which is not bound to to time and uh, uh, remunition uh, because it doesn't pay, and um, so so it's uh, it's things that that uh, it's it, translation is also a very healthy healthy kind of profession because um, if you are a writer or a scholar and uh, you get stuck with some problem or get stuck in the middle of something you can't go on with. Uh, you get a block, perhaps a temporary block. Um, well, then you could always take up the translation because there, you know, you have to work, go on with that, with that text and with, with your Swedish version and you can, of course, you can change it. You can do it again, but but still, there's something very concrete, and very um, that you can you can uh, start struggling with if you can't uh, go on with your when you start you stop uh, thinking or or the problems are seem to be difficult or too difficult, maybe wrong actually. Uh, so to the escape, the possibility to do something else is translation is, is wonderful in that sense. For translation me. is as healthy as jazz is, right? <laughs> uh, as opposed to composing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if, if, if you are a list who is uh, doing uh, transcriptions of uh, Beethoven's symphonies, it's still healthier than being a Beethoven himself, right? <laughs> 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 but right. uh, it's inter it's interesting what you're saying about um uh Lev's reluctance uh, in a way to 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 come up with too much uh like uh, I, I read that Marcus uh, works with um uh, translate worked with translators like that uh he actually didn't work <laughs> almost uh, <laughs> yeah. left everything to translations uh, to translators but in a way those cars that you are it's interesting uh, I, I know I, I've, I've heard Lev uh, read uh, and, and seen him read but um in New York but um uh, those cards I, I just thought that they a little bit like those Utamara um, prints uh uh where 
I think Chekhov says that uh, in your dialogue that uh, they're, they're a, a part that represents the whole. So there, it's a little piece that yeah. in a way doesn't need a context because it already represents the whole. And it seems to me that there is something about it in, in this kind of text. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, definitely it's uh, in a way, uh, Lev Rumerstein's works, these poetical texts, uh, there it's it's a, it's a library of, of Babel. <laughs> like it, they're endless because the contexts are endless, and you can always find a context from to a to a context there. So there's an endless possibility of a mul this multiplicity of. Uh, this multitude of uh, interpretations because there is every line is so simple, but at the same time so full of possible possible uh, meaning. Uh, not too many, not too many. Like uh, I, I love what you said about not because normally we uh, oh, translators rather because I don't consider myself a translator. Uh, try to get as many meanings as possible, just to get to every uh, shade of, of the word. But first of all, it's not possible. Second of all, not all of the um, aspects, uh, faces of the word uh, actually are at play, right? In, in a particular text and the relationships are with certain aspects, with, with the, with the uh, limited number of aspects actually. So it's very interesting, you're the first um, guest of mine who, who said that, that it's also about what it is not, not mm. what it is, but what it is uh, not. And um, and I think I learned why with, with translating Chekhov to be very careful not to add any explanations, leave out all these little words that are absolutely unnecessary and actually uh, and contrary to the to the style or the intention of of Chekhov as a writer, that he he was a master of of, of striking out, reworking his texts and cutting them. And uh, uh, there was a wonderful there was a wonderful uh, episode in one in his life when at the. Um, uh, end of his life, he wrote a, a story which is called in Russian, uh, Nevesta, the beth betrothed. I think it's a very strange word. It means the, the girl who is yeah. supposed to, to marry. Um, and Chekhov, he was usually very careful. He burnt all his, his uh, manuscripts, his, his uh, um, what you call it, brilliance, hits, uh, you know. So he left nothing, he left nothing but the finished text. Mm -hmm. Even even the, the proof, the proofs he 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 destroyed and that was it was empty, you know. But in this case, uh Chekhov was very sick at that time and and um, well somehow he he forgot or he it, it happened that you can have the final different final versions of this story and you can see how carefully Chekhov shortened the whole story, took, took away unnecessary words, put in some sometimes some words that would make it even more difficult to know if there is a conclusion or not, uh, and uh, and this this is uh, Chekhov at, at work. It's a, it's a strange experience because he didn't show that he never showed that to anyone how he worked. He was very uh, uh, he wrote in isolation and he destroyed all his all his manuscripts, and so no one could see how. <laughs> It had been working. Troy, he would uh, these days he would destroy the hard hard drive. Yeah. On the computer, right? Yeah, yeah, 
there, there are some there are some masters who, who work like this. There are some masters who like to be uh, to to drown in, in all the uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, some some do, but they uh, but they claim that they don't like Pasternak, right? He 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 demanded that of himself and of others, but I don't know. But it seems to me that there ha there is a big archive, right? On the other hand, and and we have this approach, and of course, in the, in the text itself, everything is suggestive. So, uh, especially in poetry, uh, padding is, is such a terrible disease. Padding, just uh, over -expl over explaining it. And, and yes, yes. Uh, just um just a couple of more questions because I I, I have so many to ask you and <laughs> I really um feel sad that we would have to part at some point um uh, in in your uh, dialogues uh, the uh, it seems that the way you in Starfall uh, you are there there they are real people in imaginary situations and the uh, the the situations and environments are imaginary and sort of um, even whimsical, right? It, it, you would think, uh, although they they can be uh, they're they're thinkable, and uh, it's interesting how you end this dialogue, a chance encounter, with the exact dates of life span of both uh, of both. Um, Mm, characters which are identical mm -hmm. and it's a it's it's a, it's heartbreaking on on some level yeah. just to, to suddenly come to realize that they are about seven years away from the death both of them were born they're exact absolute co-evils and they will die in the same in 1904 both of them yeah. it's, it's amazing um so this rearranging so translators are translators job um, and I'm sorry that I keep going back to the the, the notion of translation because this is um, no no it's the, the, it's fine the theme of, of, of I'm always interested. Uh, it's re rearranging in different situations. This is what this is um, what we do, and um, uh, at the same time, it's all part of. And of course, what you're saying about your collaboration with Leaf, it's it's not about from dictionary to dictionary it's from mind to mind it's from mind to mind we translate from mind to mind in, in fact mind is a uh, as far as i know i'm no expert in, in in classics but in classic languages but as far as i know the the uh, original meaning of the word muse in greek means mind mm -hmm. so uh there is no muse of translation but this is probably the the closest we can get to it so um Um, so I wanted to ask you um, this uh, last question today, um, although I wish I could ask more. <laughs> uh, I need to explain a little bit. Um, so there is this um, there is this old idea. Uh, of course, Walter Benjamin expressed it very um, poignantly, and. Uh, it's it's also in in it's scattered everywhere. It's it's in Rilke's ninth elegy that poet comes back to the valley with pure language. In other words, this is the idea of pure language that there is no original, no translation. That everything is part um, of a, some bigger or and pre-existing pure language, pure original, so to speak, pure words, and uh, mathematicians would say it's a sub two subsets of one bigger set, right? So it's just part of a bigger, if there are two bubbles, they're part of one uh, uh, bigger bubble. And as we uh, as we move from one bubble, so to speak, to, to another one, I don't know why it's a bubble, but okay, here I am. Uh, from, one, from one bubble to another, from one language to another, from one medium to another, we strengthen this, uh, pure language. He says it somewhere, I think, in that essay, Task of the Translator. So, uh, but medium, the, a medium could be different. We just, um, we mentioned Eisenstein, right? His screen version of, Bar that, that he uh, thought of um, doing, of Boris Godunov. 
uh, and also all the music transcriptions and all the jazz that we both like and uh, and everything architecture which is not which is also transient which is all, not because it's just um, getting um, older and uh, get destroyed but because as we walk around a cathedral right we the phenomenology of it right uh suggests that it's just every time it's it's different it it, it moves in a way it moves uh every every everything that seems to be stagnant moves uh even in architecture and architecture i think is the one of the closest closest things to to literature um uh, as Mandelstam also noted and uh, so there are different media, right? Uh, and we, we, tr we can transform freely from one to another. So my question is, it was a long prologue, but my question is, it's kind of a intimate, uh, an intimate question, a uh, very private question. What, in which medium do you feel most at home? Of course, theater, which is your uh, a theme that you, been working on for many years. But besides theater, which medium are you most at home at? Hmm. Huh. No, this is different, difficult question. Uh, uh, the question of what, what do you mean, feel home? Uh, uh, well, where I can work. The medium which I can struggle with and feel sometimes uh, that I have managed not uh, to do everything, but I've done as far as I can do, gone as far as I can go. Uh, is it's of course language, my own language, my Swedish language, and uh, and uh, I think it's. Well, it's pleasant to talk with you like this, but uh, um, the strictures of academic discourse uh, in foreign languages uh, is nothing that uh, attracts me, especially I'm writing more and more, less and less in, in English and uh, more and more in, in Swedish when, when, I, when I do. I, well, I, I speak foreign languages, yes, but uh, but um, the medium where I feel at home is, of course, it's it's my language. It's my my Swedish language. So language is still not not music, not painting, not photography, not film, not um, not uh, architecture. No, I will, uh, not, not buildings, space shuttles. Um, I'm, if you want, like, well. Art forms, yes. Uh, well, I, I guess painting is. Uh, I don't paint. I don't play music. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I. But but painting is, of course, it it, it is uh, extremely interesting when you can, when you have time, when you are allowed to go in close contact with a painting, seeing it several times watching going close into it several several times uh, music is is another media which is so so different it's the actual um, the actual live music live the actual uh, possibility to hear live music is is of course extraordinary uh, uh, any any occasion theater today <laughs> is very seldom gives any any satisfaction or even pleasure at least in in Stockholm but music you can always hear wonderful music there are wonderful musicians and I guess some of my yes some of my my strongest uh, aesthetic experiences are have been have been music and it has been jazz uh, it depends of course also on when in your life you have these experiences, like, for example, <coughs> uh, when uh, I'm born in 1941, so I have 19 years, when in 1960, 
uh, I think I had the shock, the shock of my life, uh, which, uh, thank God, <laughs> changed my idea what, what music is and music can be. It was uh, the concert of Miles Davis in, in Stockholm with John Coltrane, who had left Davis, had joined him for this European uh, tour. And it was an extremely uh, extreme tension between the two of them in that in in these concerts. They were they recorded, and I followed the whole tour. There are recordings from Stockholm, from Paris, from Denmark, from from Holland. Um, but when I hear the Swedish the recording of, of, the, of the Stockholm concert, I think I can I can remember those moments that was most fascinating and also most painful because I thought that John Coltrane was outrageous. It was it was something that, you know, it's it's impossible that this you can't do this like that with all these um, the sound squeaks and all these uh, manipulations of, of sound. But then then after two years, he came back with his own group and it was a, and it was like you were uh, through some kind of barrier <laughs> at that time, Stockholm 1960. So it it uh, it was a shock of my life, and I'm very very grateful I had that that also, kind of shock. Dialogue, right, and also rearranging, and also each performance is a is a unique ex experience. Yeah. Is a, is is a unique transcription in a way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and of course, I uh, as you you see, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't stop from from uh, putting also entering this jazz theme into into the starfall discussion with uh, Michael Bachtin appearing as an interpreter of of uh, in a very very uh, well um, understanding his his understanding of jazz. He says he's got got it from some neighbor, of course, in some point. It transcends these things. They transcend the real, real situations. And yeah, of course, this is pure invention, but, but it's very much in the vein of his. Actually, actually, uh, I took a long passage from one of his own texts, his Bakhtin's texts, mm -hmm. and I changed a medieval parodical. You know, uh, parodical medieval uh, texts and put in the, into the word jazz instead. Mm -hmm. And you see that jazz is also kind of, uh, it's, it's a collage of pseudo quotations, uh, auto quotations, uh, uh, ironical, semi-ironical, -iron, and, and so, you know, this this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, mess. It's kind of mess that, that that these texts make up. And it's, jazz is also makes up. It's it's a mess from which all these things that have been played before, but can be played again. And and it's different. It's different each it's time. Ancient, it's ancient art. Yeah, that is ancient art. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lars, and I'm so uh, grateful to Irina Sandamirska who introduced us. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wish you health and lots of uh, lots of work in a a every every uh, every aspect that you want to tackle. Uh, and I hope to meet you someday personally. Yeah. Thank you, Irina. It was it was great talking to you, and uh, you put a lot of difficult difficult questions. And uh, um, but it's always interesting to to see what you can say about things you're not quite sure about, because this is this is the pleasure of of dialogue. This is the way it should work. Thank you for your dialogues. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.